Who's uh, never been here before? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Who's from Longmont? Oh, oh wow. So a lot of locals who've never been in this place before. Who's, who's, uh, who ain't from around here? <laughs> well, well, a very big welcome. You're welcome back anytime. I think you'll find that we're very, or, uh, I hope you'll experience our famous Longmont hospitality this evening. Anyway, oh, do we have any members with us this evening, museum members? Thank you so much. Uh, without your support, we simply can't do what we do. So thank you. Um, there's information on membership on the way out the door if you're interested. I want to quickly touch on a few upcoming museum programs that I thought you might be particularly interested in. First is our Ansel Adams exhibition. If you haven't seen it yet, it just opened this Friday. We had a huge opening for it. I think everybody, except for some of you maybe, was here. It's up until uh, May 26th. And then there's, there's some absolutely gorgeous pics of Yosemite that were actually uh, taken well before the government shutdown. So uh, very pristine photos of Yosemite. Um, we have a uh, contemporary landscape photography panel coming up that will be moderated by Denver Art Museum's cur curator of photography, Eric Paddock, that's on March 14th, and a special community forum on fracking on March 21st. Without further ado, I'm very glad to welcome our friends from KGNU and Eco Products for this critically important community conversation this evening. Um, please welcome Maeve Conran, KGNU News Director to the Longmont Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Thank you all for coming out. This is a great turnout and what a fabulous venue. So Justin, a huge thank you and uh, all the folks here at the museum. This is a culmination of a year of work that we've been doing in collaboration with our partners at EcoCycle and really my partner in crime, Harlan Savage here. And it's been a year of programming on zero waste issues. You may have heard the uh, kind of PSA style uh, commentaries that we recorded in Harlan's voice uh, for, on everything from composting to how to not use uh, wrapping paper at the holidays and alternatives and really all kinds of everything about zero waste. And a lot of it's been about plastic, the challenges of recycling plastic and the huge problem of single use plastic. And that's really gonna be the focus tonight. And as we can see from the picture behind us, there are some real, uh, significant implications of this. So before we get started, I really want to thank Boulder County and their zero waste funding because that has made our year of programming possible and tonight's event. So big thanks to that. And uh, also thank you to the Boulder Arts Commission and the Gourmet Kitchen and Simply Bulk as well for providing the refreshments. So a big thank you. We have three excellent panelists here. We also have some folks I know in the audience who are also experts on this and we're going to hear from them in the Q&A portion. So we're we're going to go for about an hour talking about these, uh, this issue and then we will invite questions from the audience and there will be a drawing at 8 o'clock at the KGNU table for concert tickets. So if you've got a ticket, 8 o'clock at the KGNU table just outside. Well, I will introduce our panellists. We have Micah Sam Clements, who has a PhD in Ecology and Environmental Science from the University of Maine. He's the author of the book Plastic Purge, How to Use Less Plastic, Eat Better, Keep Toxins Out of Your Body and Help Save the Sea Turtles. He's also the Director of Terrestrial Science at the National Ecological Observatory Network, and he serves on the City of Boulder Environmental Adv Advisory Board. Thank you, Mike. Harlan Savage, she is currently the Communications Director for External Affairs at EcoCycle, and she's been refining her recycling and composting skills there for okay. about five years and really working through public outreach and media, and she's been helping Boulder County residents do the same. But in addition, she's been really generating a lot of media coverage about zero waste issues, and most recently about the plastic waste problem and EcoCycle's Zero Waste Denver and Zero Waste Colorado campaign. So we'll hear more about them. Thank you, Harlan. And then also joining us, we have Vicky Goldstein, who is a lifelong advocate for the oceans. Vicky earned a master's degree in marine policy from Yale University, and she worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, where she co-wrote the Monterey Bay and National Marine Sanctuary designation documents, and she served as NOAA's liaison to the California sanctuary sites 
but now here in Colorado, she went on to found the Colorado Ocean Coalition that was back in 2012, and that was in response to the growing network of chapters around the country. And she's launched the Inland Ocean Coalition, and we're gonna hear more about how we are very directly connected to this. So big thank you to everyone. Let's lay out the scope of the problem. How much plastic is there out there in the world? Mike, I know you dug into this when you wrote your book, Plastic Purge. What are we dealing with here? Yeah, so the best um, estimate that exists of the total amount of plastic that has been created is about 8.3 billion tons of plastic has been created since plastic started being created. And on an annual basis now, we're creating a little over 300 million tons per year, about 50% which of is considered single use plastic. So it's pretty incredible amount. Well, Vicky, you have some examples there, because when we talk, we might use some terms that people might not be familiar with. When we talk about single use plastic, I know straws and eliminating straws, for example, that's a big part of that. But what are, what are we talking about here? So we're looking at about 8 million tons of plastic that enter the ocean every single year. And you're like, what is that? How big is that? How much is that? So that is about equivalent weight-wise to about 40,000 blue, excuse me, blue whales. So imagine one blue whale that could not even fit in this room, the largest mammal that ever lived on the planet. And now imagine 40,000 of those full of plastic. So that will give you the, the scope of what we're looking at in the oceans. And when it comes to plastics, um, we, we have a lot of plastic in the ocean. We have everything from discarded fishing nets, um, large plastic containers, cargo ships will sometimes um, discharge materials. But the real truth of the matter is 80% of all of the plastics in the ocean come from inland sources. And they come in the form of single-use plastic bags, bottles, bottle caps, cigarette butts, single-use plastic packaging for foods. And what happens when all that plastic makes their way through the rivers and the conduit of water, they get broken up and smushed into smaller and smaller pieces. So this is an example of some of the dry materials that came out of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I can pass it around. And then this, I think, is even more interesting. This is a scoop of water that came out of it. And I'm on the advisory board of Five Gyres, and we'll have a little time to talk about that. But I'm going to pass this around. And what happens with plastic? It never goes away. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can see that it is photodegraded, which means you can't really tell the difference between plankton and plastic, except if it's got some coloration. So it's a challenge when we talk about plastic pollution in the ocean, we're really talking about a plastic smog. So I'll pass this around and, oh, thanks. <laughs> While we're doing that, Mike, I know you do a lot of presentations on plastic and you do an exercise where we try to just get a sense of how much plastic we're all using just on an individual basis, even those who are incredibly conscious about this. So do you wanna? Yeah. So. When I started writing my book about plastic, um, one of the first things I did was I really wanted to get a sense of um, how ubiquitous, ubiquitous it was and how many times a day I came into it. So one day I decided I would put a notebook next to my cell phone and when I woke up in the morning I would write down every th single time I touched something that was plastic throughout the day and I filled like 26 pages of the notebook by the end of the day and it completely changed my sort of perspective on the problem. I mean, we think of like the plastic bag and the straw and the bottle so often, and those are sort of symbolic, but we often forget that, you know, like my nylon bag that I put my computer in is plastic or our cell phone or the cord that runs to our cell phone. And once you, if you, I really recommend everyone try that once because it really changes your perspective and opens your eyes to just how completely ingrained in our lives it is. Um, and it really sort of, yeah, it changes the framework in which you operate. And in terms yeah. of the single-use plastic thing, because, you know, when we are talking about plastics, there are so many different kinds of plastic. And I know a lot of times the conversation can just be generally all plastic is bad, but of course, plastic can serve great functions. And then, of course, many plastics can be recycled, but not the single-use plastic. We'll talk a little bit more about that because I think we might have been aware of what's been happening with the market in China and stuff. We'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that okay. in a sec. But 
we're going to show a video about the life cycle of a plastic bag and, and the bigger picture in all of this. And before we do that, just to you know, further emphasize the impact on our water systems, not just the oceans. Uh, Vicky, you've been involved in an ocean coalition uh, on studies in the Colorado headwaters and the plastic that we're finding here. So we put together a microplastic working group a couple of years ago and sampled a number of water bodies, um, South Boulder Creek and the Platte, and we found small pieces of plastic in those water bodies. Um, and surprisingly, we found small pieces of plastic right off of the 4th of July trail in that water body. So when we are talking about plastics, it goes from everything from those micro fibers, those small little pieces that come off of your clothing, maybe through your washing machine or your Patagonia, I don't want to use brands, but if you have some kind of a recycled clothing, and that's maybe where some of those fibers come from. But the interesting thing is we've never had a study before to indicate that here in our pristine Colorado waters, we have small fragments of plastic. And then when you think about how water is a conduit, and it moves through all of those watersheds and the creeks and the rivers, everything on the east side of the Mississippi, or excuse me, east side of the Continental Divide, ends up in the Mississippi River. So it begins to accumulate. And Mike and Harlan are both on the uh, committee, and we are now working on a proposal to do a second study this summer. Um, so depending on our funding and the different pieces, we're, we should have more information. And then we love to see more sampling and really engage in a citizen science project where we can get more sampling, more analysis, and really get an understanding as to what we have in Colorado, and then begin to assess the watershed all the way down to the ocean. Well, we're going to play a short video here that illustrates what we're talking about. And this is uh, plastic bags, the truth behind a plastic bag. We have been taught to depend on products like plastic bags to make life easier. But beneath their appearance of convenience is a powerful industry and toxic impacts for the environment and our health. Let's take a deeper look at how plastic is made and how it impacts our future. Plastic begins with fossil fuels. When fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal are refined, they create chemical byproducts. Instead of discarding these chemicals, the fossil fuel industry uses them to make petrochemicals. These petrochemicals are the primary materials in almost all plastics. That's how companies take advantage of their cheap waste products to mass produce plastic. But what does this mean? The plastic industry isn't only responsible for the pollution in our oceans and our beaches, it's also responsible for the pollution in our skies. From oil wellheads to pipelines to petrochemical plants, each step of plastic production harms people and the environment. We are taught that plastic is cheap and convenient, but when our communities and environment bear the most burden, is plastic production really cheap? It's time to break the plastic cycle. Well, in terms of the plastic cycle, I think a lot of us are hopeful that once we chuck something into our recycling bin, our conscience is cleansed as it were and uh, it's going to go off and have be repurposed or reused or recycled and really we're not part of the problem but Harlan do you want to lay out some of the challenges the reality certainly and if there's one thing I learned from this year of uh, coverage on zero waste it's do not put plastic bags in recycling containers you will break their equipment it's yes. serious but you were paying attention Maeve that's great <laughs> you got it <laughs> um just, I think everybody here probably knows EcoCycle, but I did just want to say briefly that EcoCycle has been around for 41-ish years now, and um, we actually do a lot of different things 
in the community. So while you may have heard of EcoCycle, you associate us with one activity. When, for example, we operate the Boulder County Recycling Center, and we have ever since it opened um, in 2001. And so we do a lot of hands-on work with the materials, and we do a lot of the research on markets and try to figure out how we can recycle absolutely as much as possible um, while getting a good return um, for the county and for the community. But we also haul waste. We have a commercial hauling service, and we haul waste from businesses. And we have a very broad program um, in Boulder Valley School District and St. Vrain School District because you got to start young. <laughs> um, and then we also do a lot of advocacy and this kind of public outreach. So I just wanted to share that because I hear a lot that, oh, I didn't know EcoCycle did this. And it's relevant here because we come at this problem from a lot of different angles. And as far as recycling is concerned, um, the bottom line is that we are never gonna recycle our way out of the plastic pollution problem. And that's simply a fact. It's not a fault of recyclers. It's not a problem of people not recycling enough. Um, the problem is, is that we have an astronomical amount of plastic. And you heard some numbers um, from Mike about how much we're producing globally right now. That number is expected, that number which was over 300 million tons, is expected to double in 15 years. That is a lot of plastic. And you need to keep in mind that all the plastic that we've ever created, unless it fell off the space shuttle or something, is, is still with us. Because plastics break down, um, but they really don't ever go away. go away. They don't biodegrade. They just change form and become smaller and smaller particles, like microplastics. So that's, that's, there's some, a lot of urgency, I think, right now, because we don't know what to do with this stuff. We see a, we have a crisis, and the trajectory for the growth of plastics is just going like this. Um, we can, that's not to say that we can't recycle and we shouldn't. We absolutely should be recycling. It's something that we can do every day. And if you live in Boulder County, um, you probably know that plastic bottles, tubs, jugs, jugs and jars um, are welcome at the Boulder County Recycling Center. These are mostly plastics that um, are, well, if you follow the numbers on the back, but I don't really want to go with that because that can lead people astray. But you've probably seen the EcoCycle Guide, um, and you know that. And we want your plastic bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars, and we want them clean and dry if possible, and then we are very, very happy to recycle them. But there are many, many, many other plastics that are not recyclable, period. Um, these are different types of plastics. Um, that's not to say sometime in the future they might be because the economics and the technology changes quite frequently, but we're not really looking to that um, as a solution. So yes, on your milk bottles and your, actually your cartons as well, um, but no on many, many, many other things. And that includes a lot of plastic packaging. And plastic pa packaging makes up about 25% of the plastic stuff that, that we have. So it's quite a significant amount and it's, it's growing. Um, so, while we love recycling, again, that's not gonna be the ultimate solution, and we'll talk about solutions a little bit more here in a bit, because there are some. Can, so I, can I just jump in for jump a moment? When you think about it, starting in about 2012, the fracking just went crazy. And fracking produces um, ethane, which is then converted into ethylene. And that is really the, the the feedstock for single-use plastics. So what's been happening is that the industry is producing this amazing surplus, and they have to find ways to make it economical to use this material. I was in Target the other day, looking at Valentine's cards for my family, and they're now wrapped in individual packaging sheets. Go to the airport, your apples are wrapped. 
If you think about your markets, all of a sudden the single-use individual containers, they're everywhere. So there's been this amazing resurgence of, or surge of plastics because the product is so available and the industry really wants to find markets. And I love, I'm going to share this stat. So it is the American Chemical Council states that by 2023, the chemical industry is projected to spend over $164 billion on 264 new and expansion plants to take advantage of this natural resource. And this is the liquid gas. And I have to just share a quote. This is from the American Chemistry Council's president and CEO. He says, thanks to the shale gas production boom, the United States is the most attractive place in the world to invest in chemical and plastics manufacturing. It's an astonishing gain in competitiveness. So as we are being very conscientious about reducing our plastics, recognizing the impacts to our environment, the industry is really gearing up. And so uh, we're gonna have an opportunity to talk, to talk about how we can handle the industry side um, sometime this evening. Yeah. But I just wanted to frame it. It's, it didn't just kind of happen. It is a very strategic development due mm -hmm. to fracking. Um, Mike, do you wanna talk even, you know, going further back, I mean, kind of post-World War II when we really saw plastic becoming so ubiquitous in yeah. all our lives? Yeah, so um, when I first did that sort of experiment I mentioned earlier with the notebook and came into contact with all that plastic, I started really thinking a lot about, well, how did we get to this point? And like, why are we here? And I wanted to understand how we sort of came to live in this highly plasticized society, if you will. And so I started digging into that. And what I learned was that essentially, um, prior to World War II, there was almost no plastic. During World War II, there was a tremendous amount of plastic um, generating and plastic manufacturing capacity developed for things like nylon and parachutes and all these parts that fed the war movement. And so when the war ended, there was all these factories that had all this capacity to make plastic, but they didn't have anything to make anymore. So this group of people got together and formed something called the Society of Plastic Engineers and basically started this giant marketing campaign to convince everyone that plastic was the future. And they even went so far as to build like houses at um, shows and, and exhibitions that were, where everything in the house was plastic and said like, this is the future. And for a long time, people weren't really into it. They thought plastic products were cheap, but eventually they just kept pressing and pressing. And I thought that was really interesting, especially in light of what Vicky was saying, that you sort of have this happening again almost. You have this, gener this capacity for generation money making. So now there's a push to find a product that can basically sell that. So in one way then, is this, it doesn't seem to be necessarily consumer driven. No, I mean, this no. isn't demand on the part of consumers. This is like industry saying, we've got all this stuff, so you guys need to use it. I mean, it. I would be yeah. pretty surprised if anyone demanded their Valentine's card wrapped in plastic. In plastic. Right? That's pretty no, scary. and I just, I was uh, reading recently, um, when we talk, I wanted to just say that when we're talking about the industry, we're talking about the oil and gas industry, we're talking about the petrochemical industry, we're talking about, you know, the five or six largest multinational. Um, corporations in the world, Exxon Mobil, Dow DuPont. And what's happened is that these companies have become vertically integrated because you want, you don't want too much uh, distance between where you're, when, you, when you're fracking the gas and getting it to the point to the refineries, you want to be able to do all of it right there. So these companies that were, you know, I guess just oil and gas companies before, or chemical companies are now coming together to make this even more efficient. And when you talk about consumers not demanding it, um, apparently the plastic bag was introduced, the plastic shopping bag was introduced in the US by ExxonMobil's precursor, Unical. So I don't know that it's been the consumer's idea you know, from the beginning. And just to clarify that we are really, we are, we are really focused right here, I think, on the immediate problem with single-use disposable plastics and plastic packaging, acknowledging that there are truly essential uses in medicine and, and other areas where we do need to be, to be using plastics, but we need to be using them much more wisely and thoughtfully than we're, we are, have been up until now. Well, just getting back to that role of the consumer, it's not a consumer demand that's 
causing all of this single use plastic particularly. And yet the burden is very much on the consumer and the communities in terms of the cost of dealing with the waste, the cost then of potentially recycling it. I mean, is that, is that a pretty fair assessment? Yeah, I would say that um, that's absolutely true. And, you know, for, as some of you, you may know, um, about a year ago, China, after giving lots of indications, um, finally said, no, we don't want to take the um, trash exports from the United States and Western Europe and wherever. So that pretty much closed the door on sending all of our recyclables um, and some other materials to China. And China had been taking, oh, over half, I would say, of, of the world's recyclable waste. And so what happened was that kind of created a crisis overnight in the US because we had come to rely on China to process our recyclables. And as a result, um, we didn't have the markets. Um, we didn't have the end use businesses in this country. They've kind of withered and gone away. And um, that's made it very challenging uh, for recyclers right now, for sure, because the bottom fell out of the global um, market. Uh, so that's been something of, of, a, of a big deal. But um, we see it as an opportunity um, to do that kind of development, um, to develop circular economies within Colorado, within the United States, um, where we are doing a lot more reuse and recycle and, and not going back, not, not using linear production systems where we cut down the trees, we make the paper, goes in the landfill, but to keep these materials um, circulating. And because some of them are not recyclable, the things like um, number three polyvinyl chloride, which shower curtains are made out of, um, polystyrene, uh, takeout containers, all these, these kinds of things. EcoCycle actually last week got together with the three other public recyclers, I guess we call ourselves, as opposed to waste managements of the world to talk about how do we handle um, this challenge? Because recycling is important, but it doesn't solve the problem. And we may be quickly getting to a point where what's best for communities and recyclers, which the community pays, you pay to get all this stuff hauled away, where we say, you know what? We're just not gonna accept these materials anymore. They're gonna be some things that we will not accept. And um, the European Union, which is pretty far ahead of us at the moment, has actually come out and said by 2030, they're not gonna have any more plastic packaging that's not recyclable, compostable, or reusable because it's so much of a problem. So just to give us a sense, when China stopped accepting the plastics, the plastics are still coming. So where are they? Are there mountains of them somewhere? Are they on a barge of the ocean? Because we're still throwing the stuff in our trash or in our recycling tubs. Oh, and the trash? Well, that stuff, I mean, is, not the trash, but um, the recycling. It's something like, well, since we can only recycle about 9%, or that's what we've been doing, I don't know what the max is, but um, it's ending up in landfills and as litter and eventually in the ocean, as Vicky said, about 80% of it. So another component in all of this, we've got the consumers and we've got the petrochemical industry that are creating the plastic. There are the brands that are using the plastic. And I know that we're seeing more and more saying, no, we can be leaders in this and be corporate stewards. But Vicky, I know there's some initiatives that you've been involved in. Yeah. There's a new movement that launched in the United States last spring, um, and it had been launched prior to that in Europe, and it's called Break Free from Plastics. And the idea of that is to say, we're done with single-use plastics, so how do we go about that? How do we hold businesses and corporations accountable? So I've been doing beach cleanups. My, my background is I've been with ocean conservation for a long time, ran organizations on both coasts, and when we did our beach cleanups, we would count cigarette butts, plastic bags, bottle caps, et cetera. And so the new way of doing it is something called a brand audit. And we've done them um, in Colorado a number of times, and we have nine other chapters around the country in different states, and we've been training our other chapters to do that. And I've brought this along if anybody wants to take a look later. But the idea is to, when you do your cleanup, instead of writing, 20 cigarette butts, are they Camel or are they Marlboro? If you're looking at plastic bottles, 
Are they Danskin? Are they Pepsi? And then keeping track, and then we share that data. And then the idea is to start putting out information around the most significant polluters and really trying to get that corporate accountability moving up the chain and start getting people demanding that not only do we have to do the cleanups, which we've always been doing, but get those corporations to start taking care of it on their end. And um, there's a number of meetings that have been happening. Harlan's been part of that. And it's starting to take off. And if you can, you're starting to read articles where different corporations are looking at different packaging or your six pack rings that are edible, that can be eaten by fish, et cetera. But there is a movement, it's now international and I am optimistic, even though we do have 5.25 trillion plastic particles in the ocean, which we call plastic smog, I am optimistic that we are all here in Longmont, Colorado, in the middle of the country, talking about ocean and plastic pollution. To me, that's super optimistic. So I think we have some opportunities to move forward, and that's just one of them, um, using these brand audits. So if anybody wants to participate in creek cleanups or reservoir cleanups, let me know. And just in terms of what we were talking about, we had the picture up earlier of the surfer and the wave with all the plastic trash around him. We've all seen the photos of sharks and whales cut open, filled with plastic, of seals with those beer cans around us. I mean, the impact on our oceans is unfathomable at this point. There's an estimate that about 100,000 animals die every year just with either ingestion, entanglement, um, impact, Birds are oftentimes picking up plastic materials to feed to their young, and then they're starving because they're not getting the food. So the stories can go on and on, and they're, they're not pleasant. But again, because we're talking about it, and we have some other progressive things that are happening, um, there's still time to turn it around. Oh, I was just going to um, just add a little bit there when you were starting to talk about, you know, what the individual can do, and then... Um, corporations that are brand conscious, conscious um, have been fairly responsive when they have been provided with ed evidence that, you know, Starbucks green straws are all over beaches. And, you know, that's just one example that comes to mind. Um, that can help, that can make a, a significant difference. I would say Starbucks, for example, continues to be <laughs> a challenge uh, because while technically I guess they eliminated their straw, basically they made a new, what do you call the top that a goes cap. on the cap with kind of the straw attached to it. So they're actually using more plastic than they were. I know we're like, thanks um, a lot for eliminating the straws, but so, could you at least reduce your plastic. And yeah. no, it's not anymore. So you have to watch out for things like that. And um, I do, I do, we do think this, you know, this is a problem where all these externalities, these external costs, the pollution, the cost of, of hauling trash, um, the costs of health costs um, are, are put on individuals, are put on communities. The corporations are, are getting a free ride in terms of those costs. And I think doing more in this country with extended producer responsibility, um, telling you know producers when you're designing your product, you need to have the end use in mind, and we're going to hold you responsible for that. And we do that to some extent in the U.S., but not nearly as much as I think might, you know, be wise. Like, for example, I think there's something like half of the states have um, some kind of program like that for electronics. Um, we should really have something nationally. So that will be part of the solution as as well. And I think some we've seen some companies that are resistant try to throw the responsibility back onto the individual consumer. There's, and that's just simply not right <laughs> in, in our opinion. And I don't want you guys to feel bad, like we're recycling, we're recycling. If we only recycle more, you know, we can do this. That's so great that you're doing that. And other people need to, like corporations need to pick up the slack for sure. You know, so I think when we've talking about all this, the numbers can really become overwhelming quickly and it can seem like this conquerable problem. Um, but when, I guess one of the ways I've tried to think about it recently or a new sort of thought I've had on it is when you do think about the history, you know, and you start to think about like the 1960s, I wasn't born yet, but um, I've seen movies that were filmed then. And um, 
you know, we think of the 1960s as like so different and so long ago in a lot of ways, just because we have laptops and phones and whatnot now. But if you if you really think about it, like, yeah, <laughs> record players are cooler anyway. And so, but if you think about it, you know, like the 1960s, people had washing machines and cars and televisions and soup and shoes, like all the same stuff that we use every day in soap. Um, and they had it all with almost no single use plastic. And then you start thinking about the fact that 50% of the plastic waste we're creating is single use. And you just start to look back and you're like, these switching, these don't require new, like fancy technologies. Like it's just looking into the past and saying like, what did we do then? Or how did, you know, like, I can put a carrot directly in my shopping cart and it won't explode. Like, I don't need that bag, like, or, you know, or I can use a bar of soap instead of that bottle of body wash. So I think that's a really encouraging way to think about it for me. Or like, those paper straws. Yeah. You know, we now have about 500 million that circle the earth two and a half times on daily use. So what about those paper ones? Use those or the spaghetti ones or bamboo. And or do we need straws? I have to wonder. And I know wrinkled. some people do. Why would you want to use a straw? I know, I know yeah. some people do, but maybe if we could just have the small number of straws for the people who genuinely need straws. We don't yeah. all need a straw. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, we, yeah. we have a program called Suck the Straws Out. So I'd love for all of you to sign the pledge. You can go to the Inland Ocean Coalition website. And if you know of any restaurants, uh, ski resorts, we did get Eldora to sign it. So I'm very happy about That's that. That's awesome. And a lot of restaurants and coffee shops. So we've got about 70 that have signed. So if you know of any, encourage them to just say no to single-use plastic straws and have alternatives that are um, healthy, healthy meaning non-plastic, um, mm -hmm. that they can use for those people who really want straws or need straws. So it's a mm -hmm. simple way, and it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. It's the, I guess it's the poster child for mm -hmm. single-use plastics. Like, do mm -hmm. we really need them? You well, know, I don't, okay. when you, you guys were talking about like going back to the way we were doing things, I don't, know if any of you saw this, but last week um, something called the Loop was introduced um, right after during the conference in Davos. And it's, um, I guess there are like five or six big corporations um, that know they need to deal with this problem. It's like Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Unilever, um, Nestle's, Procter Gamble, mm -hmm. thank you. And so they have have this concept um, that they're testing. And the loop is, how do I explain this? It's like these companies are gonna test putting some of their products, like for example, putting a Haagen-Dazs ice cream in steel containers that are reusable and selling those. And what they've done is they're creating a system for picking them up, taking them away, um, cleaning them and bringing them back again. And it's gonna be really fascinating to see how this all um, plays out. I think they're piloting this in France and a couple of cities in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken. New York City is the only one? Okay. So, yeah. And I was gonna say, we also have Vessel here, and that's a really yes. great program. They've got a table out there. So hey, it's, uh, it's, it's a great way to reduce your single-use paper cup. Oftentimes, those paper cups have a plastic lining, so you still have to dispose of them. So. Keep on growing, Vessel. Yeah. And as Mike, as, Mike, you were saying, this we're not coming up with new technology here. This is what we used to do. I mean, when I was growing up in Ireland, we had the milkman delivered two pints in glass bottles every morning. And it was only really when I came over here that we did the, when I saw the plastic. We have that, We've, we know that it works. Yeah, right? exactly. There's a lot of these single use plastic solutions aren't, don't require any like thing novel or new. It's just, it's simpler. It's a, yeah, I mean, I think of the bar of soap versus the bottle of soap, soap wash or body wash that everyone uses now. You can just go back to the bar of soap, problem solved, right? Like there's a lot of simple things like that. Um, yeah. And outside of individual consumer choices, because we often, I think, get focused in, well, what can I do as an individual, which is hugely important. We're looking at major societal shifts that need to happen. And a lot of this being engineered by big corporations with profit. And, Anyone who's been living in Colorado for even a short amount of time knows that the influence of the oil and gas industry, certainly on changes to regulations on oil and gas extractive uh, practices here in the state. So what are some of the barriers been given that that's also an industry that we're talking about here with plastics? What have some of the barriers to change been? Around plastic? Around plastic. Well, in hey, Colorado. Well, <laughs> 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 I have a lot to say. You can tell me. <laughs> 
this is so geeky that <laughs> it's funny to be talking about it. So um, in Colorado, as you know, um, this, maybe not, yeah. maybe not, maybe not. Um, there's conflict between the, the state regulation of oil and gas development and local regulation. And there's a, at this point in time, where we're having conflict is with local communities that believe that they have the authority to protect the health and safety of their residents and the environment and that they should be able to do that. They are having a very, very difficult time doing that because the state says that it is the ultimate authority and because we have a variety of laws, some that uh, give the oil and gas industry, um, that industry preference um, over the desires of local communities to protect themselves. Well, something similar um, is happening with plastics and it's called a plastic, a plastic preemption. And this happened back in 1993. I still don't know exactly how this happened, but there was a bill that passed the state legislature that dealt with disposing of motor vehicle tires and recycling them, and also dealt with getting the state to purchase more um, products with recycled content. And there's one section with two sentences in it that says municipalities in Colorado may not require or prohibit the use of plastic containers, blah, 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 it goes on forever. So what that has done, it essentially means that communities in Colorado that wanna go out and ban plastic bags or ban straws cannot do it. It cannot we, regulate. We have a ban on bans, basically, yes, for Colorado. A it's ban. preemption. So, so that, that kind of stuck. That is a big deal. There are about 10 other states that have them, and it's kind of a strategy by the um, petrochemical industry, the plastic manufacturers, um, to kind of, they see what's coming and they're trying to cut it off at the pass. And um, we're actually trying to change that. So what we've been doing with many communities, yeah, is to, to volunteer. Um, volunteer opportunities like suck the straws out or the, the tax on the single-use plastic bags. But I think with the new leadership in Colorado, we might have some opportunities. So I hope all of you who are interested in getting rid of the ban on bans will join us as we enter the new opportunities that we are trying to um, open up. Yeah, and, and on the, we don't know what they are quite yet, but it's a topic. On that note, um, I was talking to our community campaigns organizer who's down at the state legislature today, and you, you may be surprised to learn that there is a lot of attention being given to this plastics issue down at the state legislature. And actually, the um, Colorado Municipal League, boy, I hope I got that right. Yeah, no, it is I think correct. that's right. <laughs> counties, Colorado counties is what I'm talking about. Um, they, they hate this preemption. They want to have the authority to regulate as they see fit in their communities. So they are actually behind this effort um, to strike the preemption. I'm not sure how it would happen, uh, but that's, that's pretty exciting. I mean, that, that means that people are, are really serious about, about doing something. Um, there's, no, there aren't, there's no bill yet, um, and we expect to see a lot of opposition once it looks like it's real and it's gonna move forward. Um, but EcoCycle, Inland Ocean Coalition, a lot of others are, are supporting this effort. And there are also um, some other side conversations around uh, dealing with polystyrene foam. So Environment Colorado and Inland Ocean Coalition and EcoCycle and others had an effort earlier this year to try to ban uh, polystyrene foam food grade. And um, there's also some interest in potentially like a statewide bag ban. So there's just a lot of conversation. And I would say that if, you know, if you're interested in this, if you care about it, now is the time to let your state representative or senator know. I can't give you any bill numbers, but just to say, I really want you to do something about single use disposable plastics. Don't like this preemption thing. And I think it will help push things forward. And because we have that preemption bill in place and have had for decades now, is that why we're seeing communities like Boulder trying to tax plastic bags because they can't come out and outright ban them? Yes, 
<laughs> there you go. Well, I know there's federal legislation as well dealing with some of this and certainly ocean health. Do you want to talk about some of those? Yes. There, um, I, I feel optimistic now. I've said that before, and I've been often teased about being optimistic, but um, our presidential leadership signed a bill this past year in 2018 called Save Our Seas. And that had unanimous House um, and House and Senate support, and it was bipartisan. And I've been working on that bill. A lot of us who have been going to Washington, D.C. and going into our legislators' offices, both the Republicans in Colorado and many others, they supported it. And pretty much what that is, it is um, it funds NOAA to deal with marine debris incidents and to continue with their plastic pollution cleanup programs. And it also directs um, our uh, State Department to work with other countries to address plastic pollution. So, and I looked at who signed the bills and they were those same Republicans that I went into their offices, I meaning a group of us and some of the folks are here in the audience working on that. So I feel that we might have some opportunities because even though you might not be in the same political vein. I think all of us care about plastic pollution. All of us care if our kids are on the beach and, and playing in that, and we all care about animals. So there are ways, and I've seen successes, so I, I do feel like we have an, a shot at some of these plastic initiatives coming up in the future. And of course, pardon? The act is called Save Our Seas Act and it was signed in 2018. I, I was just gonna say that I think this is really important. Um, just, there was a paper that came out in Nature last year that showed sort of a heat map of, of plastic flow to the oceans and the world's river basins. And if you look you know, at Southeast Asia, there's, that's where the hot spot is, right? And so I feel like our ability as a nation to collaborate with other nations on this problem is really important because we're a wealthy nation that has the resources to potentially help other nations deal with this problem. That, where a lot of it is originating from, so I think it's a really good thing too. There's also a, a bill called Off Fossil Fuels. How many of you have heard of that one? It's, it's pretty new. And basically, it's uh, organizations can sign it. The Inland Ocean Coalition has signed. And the goal is to, oh, oh excuse me, the one I was talking about a moment ago, Save Our Seas. Yeah, and this other one is Off Fossil Fuels. Oh, Act. this one is Off Fossil Fuels. And you can, um, organizations can sign, individuals can't yet, but you can uh, go to the website, and the idea is to get our nation off of fossil fuels by 2035. It's picking up momentum, and of course, because plastics, you know, they're a fossil fuel product, it ties right into our conversation. So check that out, and again, you can write to your, um, your house reps and your senators and your legislative leaders, because I certainly know by communicating with those folks, we can make a difference. And I know at a community level, there's a lot of initiatives. We talked about the eliminating straw efforts, the, the state legislation. I know EcoCycle has got a pretty exciting uh, pilot that's going to be happening in oh. Boulder County. Do you want to talk about that, Harlan? Sure. <laughs> um, so EcoCycle is developing what we call our plastic free dining pilot in Boulder County. And we are really, really excited about this and look for us to launch around Earth Day. But the idea is that um, we will be focusing on restaurants in different communities throughout Boulder County. So one of the areas will be Longmont um, and probably Lafayette, the city of Boulder, and a few more. And what we're doing is we're um, working with um, well, you, working with, engaging our eco-leaders. Uh, we have about a thousand volunteers that we call eco-leaders that are the lifeblood of EcoCycle. And in fact, we have our eco-leader coordinator over here, Rosie Briggs, who would be happy to talk to you about our program. Thank you, Rosie. Um, and what we're gonna do is see what we can accomplish voluntarily by working with individual uh, restaurants to help them el eliminate um, their use of plastic and actually all disposables, like disposable napkins and all of that sort of thing. And it's 
loosely modeled on an ordinance that the city of Berkeley, California um, passed last Thursday, uh, and it's called Disposable Free Berkeley. So we hope that this can be you know, a model for other communities across Colorado. We think that once um, restaurant owners know what to do and have done an analysis of the cost because what we find, and Vessel can speak to this, is that it's actually a lot cheaper for them in the long run um, to go this route for the most part. So we're really, really excited about it. And we've gotten you know, some positive feedback fr from a few restaurants that we've reached out to already. So look for that in the spring. Well, we're going to open it up for questions. In just a moment, there are two very important points that we'll see if we can briefly touch on. Climate change, of course, and health were really impacted by this. Mike, do you want to talk about, I mean, are there other links to climate change aside from just the connection with the petrochemical industry that plastics have? Well, yeah, I guess I, um, I think of this in a big picture. So we use about 4% of global oil production. Goes, that oil actually goes into forming plastic and another 4-ish percent in the energy required to make and ship plastic. So it's about 8% of global oil production. You know, and this is, a, this is an interesting life cycle question, if you will, because when you're taking that oil and you're potentially locking it up in something plastic that's not going to go into the atmosphere, then you, you're not burning that. So it's an interesting question from the top point of climate change, but I guess I think of it as like a bigger picture of allocation of resources. Um, so you have, limited resources for X number of growing people. And so we have to be really thoughtful about the way we allocate those resources. So allocating it um, to a wrapping a carrot that will last a week in something that will last 500 years versus just leaving it in the ground is probably with the subsequent side effects of, we talk about fracking or off-gassing or leaking methane from wells, which do contribute a lot to climate change, then you know there's a better route. It's probably best to just not take that step. Is sort of and then the impact on health. Carolyn, did you want to talk yeah. about that? Oh, I'll talk about that, that too, you sure. About health as well. I'll talk about climate some more, but you talk about um, So yeah, one of the things I was interested in too is understanding you know, the role and what does the actual science say about the effect of um, plastics and the chemicals in plastics on human health. We've talked a lot about environmental health. Um, and it was really hard to sort of get to the bottom of that story. The, the science is, you find surprisingly, not at all actually really, but you find very different conclusions if you're looking at publicly funded science versus industry funded science. And so I think it's similar to the tobacco story, right? See, so there's this, you know, and so when you wade through that, you know, you find some basic facts like 90% of adults have um, BPA in their bloodstreams at any given moment. Um, so that's pretty sweet. So, you know, and then, um, these chemicals do leach into all of us. There's a lot of links with these things um, to some potential birth defects, even cancers, um, early onset puberty in women. Um, a lot of different things have been linked to the chemicals. And um, so, you know, you see, and it's, it's kind of a tricky thing to navigate, right? Now you see a lot of water bottles that will be plastic, but they'll see, say BPA free. And often that BPA free means, yes, there's no BPA, but it's been replaced with BPF or BPS, which is potentially a stronger endocrine disruptor that less is known about. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting thing. And um, in, when I was writing my book, my wife was pregnant. And so we, I learned a lot about like the role of that on children's health. And, and there are a lot of studies that show that, you know, the amount of plastic in pregnant women and the amount of chemicals, whether it's phthalates or BPA, influence and increase the percentage of birth defects in, in children. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying that, you know, if you go eat, um, mac and cheese in the, from a plastic microwave tub, you're going like, to fall over, but you know, why not reduce your exposure if it's easy to do so and you're reducing waste at the same time? Well, just as we wrap up and go to questions, and the action items, we talked about legislation to keep an eye out, you're specifically at a state level as well. There are the different campaigns, like the, the straw one and the, the dining, it seems, uh, restaurants, because there's so much plastic mm -hmm. associated you know, at restaurants as well. Is there, if there's a final thought that you would like to leave folks with before we go to questions, you know, what could that be? I guess I, we talked at the beginning, we touched a little bit about, um, you know, plastic, and they touched it on in the video too. Plastic is, um, it, you know, it's cheap, it's durable, it can be made into almost anything, and it's super convenient. And so that's awesome. There's a lot of great uses for it, but it also kind of makes it like the pinnacle of litter, because it never goes away and you can do anything with it, and it's cheap. Um, 
you know, and so I've kind of, kind of started to think of plastic like an invasive species. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, but there's a lot of bad effects when you get too much of it in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think, you know, we want to keep plastic in our lives for important things and things that are actually lend humanity a hand in advancing itself and making our lives better. But um, yeah, we, that's, so we want to allocate the plastic we generate to those things and get rid of this single use plastic where it's creating waste and we're not really getting a benefit from it. And that's sort of my big point of view. I just wanted to add something on the, the topic of uh, climate, which is that making all this, we use a, a lot of fossil fuel to make all this plastic. And so that kind of makes the argument of, well, we're gonna store it in landfills a little ridiculous, but we, it's very carbon intensive to do that. And so obviously that has significant impacts in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and that sort of thing. And um, I would just, you know, I encourage people to think about, like, when you go and look at a piece of plastic or think of buying something, you know, I think fracking. I mean, I think different of the impacts. I mean, it's really significant, and I think a lot of people don't know that, are not aware of that at all. And that is, that, that is driving this problem, and it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens as we phase out of fossil fuels, because I think it's inevitable, we're fighting about when, um, but what is going to happen to, uh, in terms of our use of plastics? We're gonna have to uh, change significantly. And while when I started into this, and I first went to this meeting in Houston, and I thought, oh my God, it's the end of the world again, um, I have seen <laughs> so much just grassroots enthusiasm and all kinds of people who are fired up about this and concerned about it, um, that it does lead me to be a little bit optimistic that we can solve this problem if I can go that far. <laughs> I think one of the best things you can do is be an example. So make a commitment yourself personally, carry your own water bottles, bags, put your bags, excuse me guys, in your husband's cars. Because mine never does it on its own. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then there are other opportunities when you are purchasing things, you know, by taking the plastic materials out, leaving them at the store, and sending a message, hey, I don't want to take this home. I mean, I've gone to some markets where you can only get a plastic container of lettuce and have asked, can I take this home in my bag and leave the container with you because there's just too much plastic in our lives. So small things can add up if all of us take a small step to make a difference. But I really think it begins with us, and then you can be as active politically or you know, get involved in the cleanups and then be more involved on this corporate responsibility. But don't leave here thinking that there isn't anything you can do, because there sure is plenty. Well, thanks to all our guests. We're going to do some Q&A. We actually, I know, have plenty of experts in the audience as well. We'd love to hear from them and recognize them. We have folks from Eco Products, which is uh, the world's leading brand of single-use food service packaging, as we're talking about how much plastic is really in some of the food that we're coming across. But if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone. Hi there, thank you. We'll probably hear something from Eco Products, but I'm surprised I haven't heard yet bioplastics, whether it's PLA based or not. And I don't want to open up a can of worms, but I really do want to know to what degree are th those products contributing to climate change actually, and or to the reduction of plastic use? Because there's so many different layers to it. For instance, if you don't have the proper composting infrastructure and it goes to the landfill, well, there's that much more methane emissions. And I see so much even in Boulder where restaurants have compostable material, but not the proper bins. So aside from generating, it seems to me right now, so much consumer confusion, I just really wonder what does the evidence show as to the impact for better or for worse? And of let's the bioplastics. define what bioplastics yeah. are actually for people who aren't familiar with that term? Well, there has been a study um, as part of this, and I don't know if you can see it, but they actually, uh, Five Dyers and a number of other organizations, took some samples 
and buried them for two years, different types of plastics, whether they're straws or biofilms. And then they did the same thing where they put them under a wharf for two years to see how quickly they actually composted. And they found that a majority of the products didn't, that you really need to have super high heat industrial compost facilities to break it down. And that's been some of the challenges because people will be like, oh, fantastic, a compostable cup. I'll just put it into my compost pile. That doesn't work. You actually need to get it into the, the facility. So it's, it's challenging, it's confusing, and then even some of the products that claim that they can compost down in the natural environment don't. So it opens up a whole can of worms. Pardon me? So when we're talking about so those, everybody is that because it's made out of your corn cups. or natural products or I just want to know, you know, for people, what are bioplastics? It seems contra plant based. Plant based. Plant -based okay. Biopolymers, yeah. Or, or right, I guess carbon is plant based, but it's a lot older. Um, so I, I think EcoCycle would say that, you know, we there are some very good uses for PLA compostable plastics, that you do have to be very careful and make sure that they are certified as such. Um, you can look for the little BPI, which stands for Biodegradable Something Institute. How about that? My brain is, <laughs> is finished. Um, but BPI, and those are compostable in a commercial facility, which I think you, you were talking about earlier. Don't put those in your backyard compost. It, it doesn't get hot enough. Um, you could end up with microplastics in there. But if you, you know, if you live in the city of Boulder, you, you probably are composting because we have a universal zero waste ordinance. But all of that material, all of the, all of the, mat the compostable material um, that's picked up curbs curbside in Boulder County and then in like the seven other counties surrounding it to the north. Um, are treated by A1 Organics, it's a, and it's a commercial facility that is quite good. But you do have, that's what you have to do, yeah. I was just gonna say to the, I think maybe it was part of your question, or maybe I'm just imagining it, but um, I, think you had, I think it's about one-tenth of one percent of global plastics produced are bioplastics. So it's pretty, Too small. <laughs> pretty minor. Okay. Any uh, other? I have a question about getting rid of the materials that are already in our lives, uh, the waste plastics everywhere. Um, I, in the 90s, I believe EPA had some super incinerators that would uh, burn something to uh, water carbon and could be used to make electricity. I think Indianapolis may have done this for electricity. And I think there was controversy because people didn't really trust it. Like, was it really going to be that clean or not? But I still wonder, like I think, you know, for the stuff that already exists and is lying around in landfills or in the ocean, like, I mean, that, that may be a, a really good way of disposing of it, just to burn it and make electricity out of it if it's clean enough. So. Well, you could do that, although I think we're sort of moving into an era of where we want to see that our uh, electricity is generated. Um, it's clean energy from the sun and from, from um, wind. Um, and then there's also the issue of you're taking perfectly, in some cases, materials that can be reused, um, but not if you incinerate them. If you incinerate them, we're done. And it seems like that's kind of, a, would kind of be a wasteful use. So I would say for the most part, while there are I was just thinking that in Denmark, um, they burn a fair bit to like heat their homes. But I think certainly that would not be the option of first choice, and there are a lot of problems with that. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that there are emissions that are not oh, clean um, from incineration. And right now, I think we incinerate about 12% of our waste. Um, and with that comes problems with emissions coming out of the pipes. You're not, you're not ever able to really get a clean burn. So there's calls to that as well, air quality specifically. But companies are, I, I've, I've been seeing a lot, you know, I think it's Adidas or Nike is, is making running shoes out of plastic 
collected from the ocean. I mean, there are all kinds of creative things that people are doing like locally here in Colorado and in Boulder County and, and beyond. There are two ladies over here. If we can um, we wanted to have Eco Products weigh in for a second. Oh, good. Yeah, um, I'm Brooke Anderson from Eco Products um, here in Boulder. And to answer, I think, the question about bioplastics, I mean, I just want to point out, um, well, if you guys don't know, recall, we make um, food service packaging made from either renewable resources or um, recycled content. Um, and I want to point out in terms of the PLA question, um, you know, we don't consider ourselves the end-all be-all solution. You know, we are not saying we're the silver bullet. What we're trying to offer is an alternative to traditional plastic based from oil because our, resource, our products are made from either sugar cane, the byproducts of sugar production, or PLA, which is made from corn. Um, and, you know, it's by using the justification we have, even if it isn't going to make it into a compost bin, because we recognize that there is a lack of composting infrastructure nationwide, is that we really want people to think about where is your where are your products coming from? What's the upstream benefit of buying this product as opposed to buying products made from oil? Um, again, it's not. We we encourage people to use renewables. Um, you know, we don't want people to use disposables. So that's obviously the first solution when we talk to people. Um, that we partner with, um, for example, Vale Resorts, we say please use renew reusables where possible. Um, you also have to think about places where water is a precious resource, so there's also that factor. Um, so there's a lot of things, you know, it's a very complex um, issue, and also with disposables, now it's the convenience. People walk, a consumer walks into a store and says, I want my food to go. Well, what do you give it to them? Do you tell them no? So I think that's a challenge that we're going to have with restaurants is telling them, hey, no, sorry, we don't give you food to go. And if a restaurant says that, you know, that's, I mean, props to them, you know, for refusing sales. But we want to offer a different solution for people and have them know that there are, are alternatives. Um, but again, I want to say we would always encourage reusables. Um, and I know that I'm, I'm happy to also talk about, you know, PLA or any other questions if you guys have or show you samples. Um, you know, we really are trying to help people go zero waste and our company is trying to drive composting infrastructure nationwide. We, we have um, our VP of product development is on the um, BPI board. He's the president and we're very active in the U.S. Composting Council. So, you know, we are trying to say don't just buy our product. We want the actual infrastructure to be there so that people can compost and it can go to the right place. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell, little response. And I'm happy to talk afterwards um, with anyone if people have questions. Um, and then I wanted to point out that Ocean First Institute, I'm also involved with here in Boulder, and they do a lot of education um, in schools. So that's one way we are trying to be active here in the local community. And if you have interest in that and you want your child's school or a school nearby to have a presentation, then please um, you know, come talk to myself or Lauren. Yeah, if you want to do oh, I was just gonna say, um, I, I think you touched on something really important and I'm glad you said it, which is, I think when we talk about this problem or any environmental problem, it's important that we we do it in a really in a realistic fashion. And I think it's important that we recognize that you know people are going to want to get takeout food, so we can't just address this issue and say that's never going to happen. Like it's going to happen. So what is the next best alternative to do that? So I think it's really important that we we think about things like that and keep our, keep ourselves realistic because. Um, there will be a point where I get takeout food too, right? You know, it happened. All of us are going to. Um, that's some, right. And so, what's the next best option? And you know, be realistic about it. Question. Um, well, at my school, we have um, apple um, juice in the box, and we also have straws in it. In my class, we're all putting the straws inside of piles so that we don't use them, so that we don't put them in the ocean, but they were already manufactured, and we don't know where to put them. Where do you think we could leave them? Right now, we have a um, CU chapter of students who are involved with us, and they are putting together an art exhibit and they've agreed to take straws from restaurants or in storage. And initially they said, oh no, we can only take them if we can dig them out of the dumpster. And I'm like, well, why don't you just take them clean because we want to get them out and we want to use them as an educational opportunity. So talk to me after. Just while we're getting the microphone up there, I have to give kudos 
to children. I think they're leading the way in recycling. And anyone who's uh, the youngest child, and I think this is thanks to education uh, done by folks like EcoCycle and the many other ones. If you go into uh, schools and you're doing a great job with the straws, great job. The kids know which bucket things go in. And I think they're leading the way on that. And I think that's really encouraging. There are so many tendrils I can go off with in this conversation, but I'll jump on the children and the school one. Um, my name is Tamar McKee. I'm founder and CEO of Kala Cloths. Kala means food in Tibetan, and cloth because it's the exact opposite of plastic to wrap and honor your food. My husband and I make both beeswax-based and vegan wax-based uh, reusable, washable, compostable uh, replacements for plastic wrap and bags. Uh, something you can use in your kitchen, but also on the consumer end of things. You can go to the cheese counter at your grocery store, bring your big collar cloth, these are just samples, and get your cheese wrapped up there. Bread is another great way to do that too. Anyway, one thing that I do as a tip, it's not a question, so I do apologize, and hopefully it maybe spurns some questions, is um, so much of kids' food is packaged in single use. It's horrible. And yes, you can get around with it by getting your big block of cheese and cutting it up and wrapping it in something like a collar cloth. Um, but if you buy a granola bar, if you don't have the time to make it, um, I take the food out of, unfortunately, the single-use wrapper, if I go that far, and I wrap it in something like a collar cloth. Because if you go to kids' playgrounds, they are just flying around with single-use wrappers. My kids and I will go around and pick it up after school and just put them in the garbage just to try to keep it from going on in inland waters and whatnot. So those are things that we can do at the kids' level and things you can do at the consumer level. Um, again, we're Colocloss. We love what Vessel is doing. Uh, Eco Products, too, a shout out. Um, and we're based here in Boulder, and we make it here, and there's no petrochemicals uh, involved. So thank you, Harlan, for letting me know about this event as well. So. And I love those cloths. I have some. Please and I also too. love Ocean First <laughs> Institute. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you sitting there, Lauren. Um, how can our schools help? Good question. <laughs> how can the schools help? You can do a variety of things. You can start up a club that is all about not using plastics or ocean protection. And you can do exactly what you're doing, going to events, saying no to straws, and trying to get your friends to do the same things and be an example. And make your parents feel bad if they do. <laughs> yeah. Be an example, that's big. And just getting back to the ubiquity, if you have kids, you become so aware of this. If you get a, a kid's drink at a restaurant, they come in the plastic tub with the plastic lid and the plastic straw. And if you get water and something else, you get twice as many. And I always make it a point, I said, they're big enough that they can drink in a glass. Yeah. Just say no straws And I'll take for responsibility starters. for them. You, you know, you can do that. And then they start to think about it too. So I think there's a lot to do. Um, so I have a, a, point, a couple things to say. First of all, I think Edna's point about the, I think it was Edna, um, about the, I think it's called the ethylene. It's a real simple chemical compound and the oil companies are making it more complicated, but it's such a simple compound, you can use it for fuel. And instead of going the route of making this complex, plastic film that you can't do anything with, take a step back. I mean, I think what we're doing with the, our water, um, the, the plant here, we're using that methane, fuel the trucks, you know, things like that. Denmark, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of us using those simple, simple hydrocarbons for fuel. So the, the oil companies are going farther in making these products that they're, they're pushing on us. Um, we need to go back and take these just simple compounds, and I don't think I don't think there's really anything wrong with using them for fuel, burning it, and that's it, and you get back your hydrogen, your carbon. When you put it into plastics, you're binding it, you're making it hard to break down. It won't biodegrade, as you said. Um, kudos to Eco, I mean, yeah, Eco Products, because it does fully break down, I think it's so much better than any of the plastics, even if you don't put it in a compost pile. And I think people need to consider composting more than even recycling, because it uses a lot less energy. It stays here. And um, even we even compost the, you know, the uh, 
Ice cream containers, there's a, there's a plastic film, but at least the cardboard gets composted and you're left with a thin piece of film rather than throwing that whole ice cream container away. So I think we have to think real simple. The oil companies have made these complicated compounds out of just basic hydrocarbons. And I think this was eye-opening when the, the hurricane in Houston, you have these plants that were, um, they had to be closed down because of the hurricanes. And the heat that they were producing, I mean, because they had to be closed down, it was just eye-opening all that um, byproducts of the petroleum we're using for our cars are taken to these plants. And these, they couldn't produce the plastics, and there was talk about plastic maybe becoming more expensive, really short-lived, but I was hopeful it didn't happen. Um, but at Very the expense of a, you know, a, a hurricane. But anyway, it's, I think we need to be aware of those plants are out there as well, just running, and when something like the hurricane hits, suddenly, it's creating more of a disaster. I mean, it was, it was. Well, they don't call that whole area in Houston, that whole petroleum area, it's Cancer ugly. Alley for no it's reason. It's ugly. It's and pretty I'm, intense. I'm sorry to say that it's I just did like a tour of that area. Into, yeah, it's, it, a it's really, we need to be aware that we could be turning our Colorado into that with the fracking. Anyway. Well, we've time, I think, just Thank for a couple you. of quick questions. We're going to be wrapping up soon. Okay. So. Thank you so much. I feel stressed. Sorry, guys. I'm doing my best to you get to all of you. Somebody over here has been waiting for a long time and also over there. Thank you very much. My question is about e-commerce and the growing trend of people ordering, I don't know, whatever good from any country and it's showing up in a box. What is your advice for cracking the nut of that ridiculous trend and the shrink wrap that goes around every single pallet that's shipped from any manufacturer. It's probably by volume a much bigger problem than straws. I think it's... Well, it's part of the packaging. It's in that, that category. It's huge. Is there a movement or are there initiatives to get at the e-commerce industry? So part of the Break Free from Plastics initiative when we launched it last year, that was one of the categories. So when you... Just hearing the conversation, there are so many segments of this issue, and that is one of them. So there are subcommittees that are working on how you go about that, addressing that. And it includes not just the e-commerce, but um, your dinners that you can purchase that show up in a box, and that's growing. So it's really a, a balance between what we want as convenience, not wanting to go to the store, it's, a, it's, it's part of a, a big problem, and I think the first step is to really get all of those problems identified into a category or categories, and then, then begin to strategize with organizations and figure out what the next steps are. And because this is a one-year movement that just started, we're in the early stages. But it is on the list. And if I could weigh in on this, uh, Harlan and I did a call-in show on this last year. Buy less stuff. We're just buying too much. We don't need it. You know what I mean? So that's my two, two cents. Just stop buying. <laughs> you know, and if we kept the packaging for the stuff we needed instead of the stuff that we think we need. So. But in, just real quick, in answer to your question, there are some companies that are working on that. And I believe it's Prana has kind of taken the lead. And, and I'm pretty sure that they're not wrapping their um, clothes in plastic anymore. That was their, that was their goal. So there's... There is a lot going on out there, and I actually think that things like the EU's decision to um, ban plastic packaging that can't be recycled, composted, or reused is going to have effect in the United States as well. These companies work all over the the world. Um, there, you know, there's testing going on using mushrooms, you know, to make containers out of. So. I think there's energy there. Process. Yeah. I think I saw something in the news earlier this week too that said Samsung had announced that they wouldn't be wrapping any of their smartphones, tablets, et cetera, anymore in, pa in plastic packaging when they sell them. So that's pretty cool. Go ahead, we have a question there. Thank you for your, um, for your panel tonight. And I, I just, you're probably already doing it and I just have missed it, but if, if we could have more of these types of panels um, with publicity at the farmers markets and all of the fairs. Um, this is something that we all have to be involved in. 
in trying to turn around because it is shocking how bad it is. Thank you. And thanks yes. for mentioning the farmer's market because the Boulder County farmer's market have really been leading in this as well. Because when you buy something at a farmer's market, it's not going to be shrink wrapped in, in plastic and bring your cloth bag. And then essentially, it's a, it's a zero plastic transaction and you're dealing directly with the farmer. So thank you for, for giving them a shout out as well. Hi. Thank you, Maeve, and everyone for the work that you're doing. One thing that I haven't heard is, um, other than for small packaging, is alternatives that would take the financial incentive or power from oil and gas and such that have all these repercussions that we're talking about. For, I'm curious, for instance, Henry Ford in the 1940s fueled and made an entire car out of hemp for the larger pieces, tires, and things of that nature. And that just opened up in a big way, Colorado being at the forefront of the movement um, with the passing of the 2018 Farm Bill that delists industrial hemp as a federally regulated product. And we've already seen Patagonia and many conscientious companies going that route um, in terms of water also preserving. And I'm wondering how is that influencing your campaign that has sort of been leading this awareness, making the association from oil and gas extractions and bringing the focus to less is more and back to basics? That's a great question. I think that might be the last question, Amanda, I appreciate you bringing it up. Does anybody want to weigh in? Hemp, we love hemp. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about this quite a bit lately. And while I can't tell you specifically um, what's happening, there is just enormous opportunity there. Um, we have been in contact. There is a, an organiz a new business formed by two graduates of the LEED Business School, and their whole focus is actually working in the hemp in marijuana industry, which is because it is so highly regulated and for other reasons it uses an enormous amount of um, plastic. And so they're looking at hemp as an alternative. But hemp has been around forever, and humans have used it for just all kinds of things, and we've kind of forgotten, and I think it's definitely making a comeback. So a huge thank you to everyone for coming out. It's been a really invigorating as well, and I think if all of us go out and do you know, a couple of the actions we've outlined today, I think that's going to make a big difference locally. But thank you to all our panelists, Vicky Goldstein, Harlan Savage, Mike St. Clemens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a big thank you to the Longmont Museum. Thank you, Justin, for hosting us in this incredible facility. What a, what a treasure for yes. the Longmont community to have this here. And once again, thank you to Boulder County and zero waste funding that they provided to KGNU uh, to, to work in partnership with EcoCycle for the last year. You can find the entire archive. We've done loads of stuff from e-waste and how to get rid of all the technology uh, waste that we have and plastics and composting. It's all at news.kgnu.org. And next year, we're excited to start a new partnership with Flows, which is the Foundations for Leaders Organizing for Water and Sustainability. So keep your ears out for that. We're going to be continuing looking at all of these issues. So thank you everyone for coming out. We're so appreciative. <laughs>